do, but balancing all the needs of the grid with all the expectations that our customers have for what, what that grid can do. Um, I'm gonna leave it at that, and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Corey, here, who's gonna go through a few of these uh, different pieces. Great, great, yeah, I'm fine, so. Thanks, Nathan. Corey, thanks for having us today. Appreciate uh, you inviting us. Happy to be out here with the, with the public and the university to inform group and to talk about our distribution system, microgrids, and PD. Uh, Nathan and I are shoulder to shoulder. Uh, my, my role at Power is to uh, make sure the grid is being developed and modernized in a way that can accommodate the things customers need. Nathan's role is to help design the program and tell us what customers need. So he's really our customer. What do we need? What do they want? What are the customers looking to? Uh, and we can uh, we can uh, support the uh, the donuts and stuff after the pub. Not the beer. Yeah, 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 we can yeah, support yeah, the beer. So, so. <laughs> but, uh, that's, uh, okay. Feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Uh, we haven't done a good job getting out and talking to the public from the distribution side. Our communications group's done a great job with the supply plan, and that's happened for the last few weeks. Now it's the distribution plan. This is where all of you folks are connected to your regulators and your stakeholders. So uh, here we are. Talk, tell the world what we can do, uh, what we can't do today, and what we can do in the future and work ahead. So please ask questions. Is my page not working? Excellent. Saskatchewan is geographically massive, right? 652,000 square kilometers. We serve all of it except a small portion of the city of Saskatoon and most of the province. So, um, in the south, as we all know, prairie lands, flat to the north, forest, tough terrain. We have to serve every customer anywhere in that system. So we bring it down more or less, we look at it from a distribution perspective. We look at it three, three types of customer areas or categories. Cities, high density, right? Um, small lots relative to the rest of North rural. Uh, subdivision development, and with all this load growth, we have to develop subdivisions differently. EV load planning is a massive issue urban areas, and they're small usually. Most people, five, seven kilowatt kilometer units. So from our perspective, EV load, and finding out how to keep infrastructure moving up with that EV load chain is our biggest issue in the city. Rural, uh, very different beast. Long, long radial lines, meaning there's no redundancy. There's long lines out the roads. Bigger customers. Farms are getting bigger and fewer. Oil field customers are, are large motor loads. Irrigation's growing dramatically in the province, a big motor load only used for several months a year. And so it's really about rebuilding that infrastructure in an affordable way, just because there's just so much of it. And the timing of electrification as opposed to the larger question, when is it gonna happen in the rural area? And large DGs, right? Hundreds of kilowatts, 50 kilowatts, far and few, it just can go bigger. And then the third area is the north, which has been spoken to as well. Uh, indigenous communities, there's a lot of money coming into those indigenous communities, which is great, but they're, and they're building water treatment plants and houses, and we need to get electricity for them. Long, skinny lines in the north through the forest. Um, we have a huge vegetation land across, and rebuilding those lines is massively expensive. So we've got to find economic ways to serve, to serve our indigenous uh, groups in the north. And they want to look at electric too, a lot of them. So that's, uh, that's a concern. And often home builders out there are building, unfortunately, two by four stick construction which is for us is a massive future liability for all of us. Uh, whatever our rates, the cost that we're for our rates, everybody else pays those fees. So any inefficient decision just rolls back to the rate. Yeah. So as a, as a province, we have to figure out ways to, to move forward. Microgrids are, are a key focus in the north, which has been spoken to them. And thank God you brought that up. The north is where we're looking at microgrids. So. We have 550,000 distribution customers, uh, enough lines to circulate here three times, and we're spending 3.5 million a week in investments in the uh, distribution system. It's changing all the time. And most importantly, we serve three customers per kilometer line. Most of the utilities serve 15, 20, and max is 62. I'm sure the city of Saskatoon is about 50. So that density is spreading costs over, over more people. Saskatchewan, we just we have that issue of costs have to be spread over less people. So we've got to do this right. And Nathan spoke to this a bit. Um, you know, what, how would we see the future? Well, 
the deal is going to be a huge that everyone's talking about. That's going to be a big customer. When, where, how much, what circuits out of our 3,500 circuits do we have to fix first or build first? How do we do that? Electric heating. Um, when's that going to show up in what way? How much electrical load across the whole system? We know we're going to have other parties, and that's fantastic. We need, we, we need third party solution providers working with us. We are here to take care of the grid, the supply, but all these other aspects where they, we need to work as partners to say, what can you do with your customers? What sorts of things? We'll, we'll talk about when we connect that to the grid and make it work. We see solar and storage systems, more so than just solar. We think storage is, is critical. And the grid in, in the future, a uh, few stages away, maybe in the more longer term, the grid will operate in real time and will control our assets and probably interact with customer assets so it all runs autonomously in lockstep in place, making changes and adjustments. That's the future state. Um, and we really see long term that uh, customer PG will be part of the supply chain. But in the short term, it's more of a, how do we accommodate enough of this to reach the system because we don't know where we need it or where we need it. So in the short term, we've got to figure out where we are. In the long term, it'll become an asset that we can leverage for the whole time. Today, however, DG is not a big part of our supply chain. It's just too small at this point. But we are watching it and accounting for it. I'm going to skip through this because I want to get to the, uh, the DG microgrid side of things. But we are building our first um, EV ring subdivision. So instead of one transformer for 22 houses, we're looking at a transformer for every two or four houses. So it's just a whole different design, right? If you have an F-150 Lightning, they draw 19 kilowatts. If you have a uh, Kia Soul, they might draw 7 to 11 kilowatts. Your house right now probably peaks at 4 to 5 kilowatts. So that vehicle itself could be drawing at three times so if everybody does that, well, how big do we build the cable and how much is that going to cost? And when do we do this? It's going to happen every day, right? We, as we go from the middle, it's going to happen. We're working on things to figure out and forecast where and when that's going to happen. <laughs> how fast do we build? So our estimate in, in 2023, uh, in 2035, about 142,000 EV in Saskatchewan. A year later, make that 220,000. So that's about a 50% increase in our forecast for EV. That acceleration curve is, the acceleration curve is accelerated. That makes sense. Engineers are intelligent, I've said that time. But that's what's going on. So it's real. It's not here yet. The, 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 I'll say the impact of the capacity constraints, but it's coming. Um, this is what we see as uh, annual sales as a percentage of all vehicles sold. We're about 2%. Five is a tipping point. 10. Kind of through studies comes six years after you hit one percent, then eighty percent comes six years later. So that kind of follows that curve. That's vehicles sold, not total vehicles. But it all supports that curve. And what we see is that 26, 27 range, things on the system, spot for spot, they start to fall. So we have to get ahead of that. <coughs> okay, microgrids. And I've, I've got some things I'd like to speak about here. Really in that DG space, and, and thanks to the previous speakers. A lot of the things he said, I'm nodding. A lot of things he said, we're doing, and uh, right, right in stride with you folks. The Sharm Lake is 96 kilometers north of Wawash, northwest part of the province. Uh, it's a fully indigenous community, but it's not a, re a registered or, or recognized First Nation. They are about a 30 kilowatt peaking community. Uh, that's what they're drawing. Uh, our line is old and, and needs to be rebuilt. It's going to be about eight to ten million dollars. Currently, we need to do about 1.8 million in bed zones within our line. So, our revenue out of the community is, is about 30,000 a year, and we have to spend about 10 million. So, we will serve, we're here to serve the communities, but that's not a good economic equation. So, what can we do differently? With that kind of cost comparison, we, we're putting in a microgrid, and we're working with Ryan Jansen of SRC and others at SRC. Uh, Ryan and I worked together for a number of years. And we're going to install a solar battery diesel generator combination. Right? So out of that combination, uh, they've used their software and design to figure out that what's the optimum combination of those two. And there's a microgrid controller to decide how to manage the load over time. Every minute of the day, every hour of the day, 24-7, 365, you point these power. So 
Sun's in the air right there. Battery has done show to go around. So about 84% of the power we're forecasting will be renewable. However, even though we've oversized the solar by seven and a half times, even though we've oversized the battery by about eight times, it's 180 kilowatt battery, so about, about five times. And the diesel generator is oversized. Um, we still, well, sorry, the diesel don't fit into that, but we still have to run diesel 500 years. So you get that. You have to plan your capacity for the worst hour of the year, right? So there's no solar, there's no wind, and the batteries are done. What do we do? We both go on power. We build reliable, predictable, available generation. Right now that's natural gas, life cycle plant, coal. What will it be? SMRs, you know, CCS natural gas, carbon sequestration. We're figuring those base load or those reliable solutions out. But right now, that's where we're at. And, and um, so this really shows there's a, definitely a place for renewables, and, and we know that, and, and we're trying to figure out that whole equation. So if Susan, we spoke about here, these are the kinds of things that we've got to solve is we have to serve every customer in the province every hour of the day. So how does solar fit into that equation? How does battery fit into that equation? Uh, there is no uh, one silver bullet, as we all know. So these are the challenges. On the distribution system, we have to figure out this equation on every transformer. There's 180,000 transformers. Your bay is different than their bay is different than the Roseville circuit is different than the Northern circuit. So all of these, right? So we need to get it done. So this is what we're doing. We're currently uh, distribution transformation, which I'm the portfolio manager for. Electrification is really driving our grid modernization and grid hardening. Uh, we need. Maybe it was uh, uh, why you spoke to um, single uh, one way flow. We have to get it two way. We have to see it. Two way communications, we need two way one flow. So, but we need to see every device in real time. So, we're putting out data mining, we're putting out smart technology on our substations and on our lines. That's a huge infrastructure lift. You know, 550,000 years. It's going to take us a few years, but we're moving in. We're starting to get some data, we're starting to be able to make better decisions. But it's going to take some time. In the interim, uh, just we're looking at our disposal to our maintenance core load management. Team. What can we do as customers to say, could you start shifting off peak? Could you store some of that solar and drop it at peak if it's a supper time an hour in winter? Uh, right now, our price signals aren't there. Our price signals are no matter when you use energy, 15 cents. That's a problem because that's not the real value, that's a legacy issue. So we have to get to a point where we can break that into a few blocks. How can you help us in this block overnight? How can you help us in this block when we go solar? How can you help us in this block, you know, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m.? Those are diff those are different questions, different solutions. So we're modernizing our grid. Uh, we're going to be using big data and real-time analytics to understand every circuit, every minute of every day of the week, and how we can start to get us close to in a perfect world, we'd be off and on in time real time. That's what we're hoping to drive. Um, so now DG, how does it fit into all that? As I said, right now, um, we're trying to accommodate. We're, we're, we're figuring out how to get into the system what impact it's having. Without data, we can see the modern. Once we have real data, we can see what it's happening. The OASA site on the edge of the city, as, as Doug alluded to, we'll see it ramping up to 10 megawatts. 12 goes over, it goes to two. 12 passes by, it's back at 10. Something has to replace that eight megawatts, and that's our gas plants moving up and down. Lines take that hit too. It's not just the supply, it's the lines and all those assets. The transformers tap down, they tap back up. Right? So all that equipment takes that hit. I'll just share a few other quick how am I doing for time? 30 seconds. 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> so it's just a um, we have we have several other projects. Many of the customers have Lumsden, for example, on um, their wastewater treatment plant, they put a, a 500 kilowatt solar and a battery out there, and now they're looking to check out other places. So Outside of net metering, we can still hook up uh, generation. We, we, I mean, you have to do study. We study net metering, see the impact on the grid, we also study non net metering. So the 100 kilowatts is more of a, that's a net metering uh, commercial value. It's not a technical stumbling block. Technically, we can like, study the metering and then hook it up. So we do, we will look at legacy solutions as uh, we will look out to people on the grid. It's just as you get bigger, 
they start to trade a little stuff with the bigger infrastructure. So we are really the grid looking out, and, and we're, we want to provide information to you folks. Is here's the value to the grid, hour by hour, location by location, and that's what we want to get to. Uh, and, and so I guess we're asking for your, your patience and understanding that we are we, we get it. We're moving that way. We don't have all the answers yet. I don't think we ever will. But we want to start that conversation and uh, and really let you know we're working on, on getting there. Here's how we see it from the grid. And how do you see it? Let's get on the same side of the table because this is a massive lift for the world, like on Saskatchewan, and we all have to pull in the same direction on this stuff. So, um, we have a lot of knowledgeable people about generation of the grid, and I think anything we can bring at us, we might not be the expert in your project, but we can tell you how we're going to get to the grid and we'll get to. I'll turn it back to Nathan. And, uh, yeah, and I think we got a, you know, a slide here. Uh, or two, but um, but I, I'm, I'm interested in talking about sort of next steps and thinking about this is this is all exciting for us talking about the stuff that happens on the distribution system and the way SAS Power is sort of transforming its system into a grid that can configure a way to accommodate all these new technologies and all these things that, that different customers want to want to want to do. Um, so I mentioned I lead our customer search team. We develop these customer facing programs programs and services with the goal of providing value to customers. That's our, that's our objective. What would provide value to our customers? Um, an important component of that process is making sure we're collecting input and feedback and giving an opportunity for customers and stakeholders to contribute and participate in, in that process so that we're, we're prioritizing and are directing our efforts at areas that actually provide, provide value to customers. Um, and it's a two-way relationship. So, we're, we, my team, of course, that my, my group kind of represents customer interests along with, with some other groups, but customers have expectations. Different customers have different expectations. So that's an important consideration when SAS Power is trying to figure out how, how do the asks and expectations of this customer impact the asks and expectations of, of this customer. And while we're doing that, we're also trying to balance SAS Power's sort of business priorities and strategic imperatives as a, as a crown utility with the you know, the obligation and opportunity to serve everybody everybody in the province. So it's, you know, I'm not up here sort of, you know, complaining, it's, but it's complicated. And I think you all, you all probably appreciate that. So to date, uh, my team has primar primarily been focused on kind of three, three buckets, buckets of work or areas that we work on. Um, energy efficiency and affordability. With increasing costs, not just in utility space, kind of across the board, affordability is, a, is an increasing issue for, for all customers, all customer segments. And so one of our top priorities is to, is, to, is to figure out a way that we can help customers manage those costs. And one of the, one of the best ways to do that is to become more efficient or, or using less of your electricity. And one of the things that I'll say is that's also the, the, the most bang for your buck or the best way for you to reduce your costs. Not necessarily to install solar on your roof before you've kind of pursued those energy efficiency initiatives to try to get your get your demand or your draw as, as little as you can before you before you kind of take some of those next steps. Uh, so expect to see um, energy efficiency discounts in stores now. The plug for one of our programs. If you need smart thermostats or smart lighting controls or some specialty LED, LED pieces, you can find those. Uh, but we'll continue to kind of roll those out the rest of the fall here and into the spring and into the new year and the coming years. Uh, one area I'm just going to touch on quickly is the EVs and electrification. Usually that's the, the part that most of the audience is most interested in, but today, given that we're kind of talking about customer generation, we'll, we'll gloss over that piece and you can come chat with me if you want to pick my brain about uh, EVs and electrification and all those kind of pieces. But the last piece, customer distributed generation. So that's one of the areas that is maybe most complex or most difficult from a customer solutions perspective to try to figure out some solutions that work for everybody. Some customers want to generate their own power. Some customers want to purchase only zero emitting power. Some customers want to generate power and contribute to the supply line and send it back to the grid. Some customers aren't interested in any of that. And so coming up with solutions that sort of check all those boxes and create the flexibility that different customers have and the different expectations that customers have uh, is, is, is the hardest part. But I think one thing we know going through some lessons and things we've learned through net metering is that maybe a 
maybe a one size fits all approach isn't isn't the most effective way to make sure that you know we provide the flexibility for different customers to do the different things that they want to do and how they want to interact and work with SaaS Power. You know, one thing that I want to kind of close with here is that in the coming months, you know, maybe into the new year, uh, we expect to see and provide further opportunity for customers to contribute in the customer generation conversation. So I know maybe 12 months ago, we sort of started this conversation as it relates to net metering. And I know some of my team have been out talking about a shared renewables model. We've kind of been, we've been sort of floating around there. Um, but I want to make sure we provide opportunities for people like yourselves and other interested parties to help, to help prioritize where we should focus and what we should be focusing our efforts on at SaaS Power as it relates to customer generation. So even today, we heard all about virtual net metering and community, community energy co-ops and microgrids, um, net metering traditional, solar plus batteries. That there's a lot, of, a lot of sort of segments that we can target to figure out how to come up with solutions. And so we're gonna count on groups, groups like this and people, people like all of you to help Help direct us and say this this is the area we should start with this is where we should start figuring things out so I don't have anything anything any dates for you but stay tuned because this is an important step for you know that my team when we're thinking about what's next in customer generation I think we've got to connect with all of you first and figure out what should be next in customer generation uh, and so with that Corey we appreciate you all for, for listening to us thank you very much Take questions if you if you got it.
have implemented virtual net metering uh, programs. Uh, however, as I said, th this is one of those one of those areas that we're looking at, saying how can we how can we do more in that space and figure out what that might look like. Uh, so expect that to be sort of considered once we once we start to get these engagement initiatives kind of organized. And I think where where I would be maybe Nathan and I with a healthy tension, I would be pushing on him a little to say whatever we do in the customer space, um, let's make sure that the grid can handle and that we're making sure all ratepayers are, are being taken care of in any, any program we look at. So I think that's a conversation we need to have internally and with the public, is that anything we do, uh, we need to consider uh, the impacts it has on, on Saskatchewan. But uh, I think that virtual net metering is certainly 